I'm not sure how to approach this morning's lesson, so let me tell you a story of what happened years ago in Logan, Utah. Jan and I and our kids lived in a house next to the church building. It was a home that was owned by the church as part of the compensation of our working with the church there. And my, it fell on my lap, mostly by my choice, to go over early and fix coffee and prepare communion. And while I did that, I would think of the individuals who would possibly be there, and I'd be praying for them by name and and thinking about the fellowship we were about to enjoy. And sometimes when I was in the right frame of mind and I actually appreciated what I was doing uh, because I knew that people would appreciate that I did that, I would fix up the coffee and maybe even have some, some snack of some kind. But it's that going back and forth next to the house and to the church building on Sunday morning oh, I need to go get my Bible and my notes or, or whatever I was, uh, I needed to go back and forth. As I stepped out of the building going over to my house, I saw a fellow walking on the other side of the road. So I prayed, Lord, it'd really be neat if you just put it on this guy's heart to come to church this morning. Had no clue, not been thinking about it. Suddenly, he just has a desire and he shows up. That would be really cool. I went back and got my Bible, and I came back over to the house, and I went downstairs to get the coffee more ready and make further preparation, final preparation. came up, and I stepped outside, and I saw this fellow walking toward the building. True story. He came up, and I said, are you coming to church this morning? He said, yeah. And I said, what made you decide to come to church today? He said, I was walking by. (laughs) And I had gone by this building. Do you guys have... A lot of times, and I've just always been curious, what goes on here? What kind of a church are they anyway? But today, for some reason, it just suddenly hit me, I want to go to church today. I said, I have an idea why, and he said, why? And I said, I just want you to know, I just prayed for you. Really? Well, he came to our Bible class and then stayed for church. And after church, he said, do you do weddings? And I said, yes, and I gave him my $100 spiel. I charge $100 for a wedding, and if you'll meet with me as a couple four times, I'll knock off $25 each time so that my part of the wedding would be free, which I figured would fit his budget. He's 18. And so he brought this up, what I do, their wedding, and I said, well, tell me a little bit about what's going on. He said, well, uh, the girl I'm with is 16, and we're expecting a baby. Oh, but needed premarital. We worked through some premarital counseling stuff, and I performed the wedding for this couple. A few weeks later, had the privilege to baptize him into Christ. And a couple years after, a year or two after we moved away from Logan, some of the ladies in that congregation studied with Jamie, and she was immersed in the Christ. So Jamie and Joe are not only both in Christ, but their daughter Angel now is growing up in a home where Mom and dad are a little more in line with the Lord. And their two other sons, Jose, two other children, Jose and Julio, are now having an opportunity. And in fact, they had been involved in some mission work, going to Haiti. Several years they went to Haiti to do mission work. And I've kept in contact off and on through the years. It's been a struggle. You can imagine you're 18 and 16 and they got married and they're going to have difficulties, right? They're going to have difficulties if they had waited until, and they're going to have difficulties now. It's just that the difficulties are so much more magnified, they're huge, much more huge at that age than they would be had they waited. In fact, they may not have married if they had waited. So on goes the story. Joe had difficulties through his life with drugs and alcohol and partying and He got involved in so many drugs that his wife said, Jamie said, I can't let you stay around the house with the kids. So he stayed with other relatives for a while. I'm telling his story because Sunday, two weeks. Sunday, two weeks ago, Joe decided that life wasn't worth living anymore. And so he hanged himself. And his aunt found him two days later. you get to a place where 
there's no hope. Or the criticism of yourself is so huge, so big that you can't get over. How could God ever accept me now? I've ruined my life. I've ruined the lives of, of those. It'd be better for them if I weren't here. It's a twisted thinking. So the, it's got me thinking a lot in this last couple of weeks about dealing with this very forthrightly. So I went down to Logan and wanted to be with Jamie and the kids and their family at this time and went to their funeral services, went to Joe's funeral services and was struck with a number of things I want to use as a springboard into this morning's lesson on death, dying, and grieving. Because of no matter how someone dies, you're still having to go through the process of grieving. It's just the suicide complicates matters. It becomes, as a friend of mine just said this week, as we were working through some of the ramifications of this, my friend Fred says, suicide becomes the devil's playground in those who survive. What could I have done? What could I have said? Why weren't I more sensitive? Uh, maybe this is what I should do. The children grow up with this feeling as well, and often it's a generational thing that children of ones who commit suicide will at least be tempted to do so themselves. There's no reason to live. Let me say, first off, the Bible is silent on the issue of suicide, the rightness or wrongness of it. For me to proclaim that this is wrong or that this is right would not be correct. The Bible doesn't address the rightness and wrongness of suicide. I can infer from what Scripture teaches of the love of God and the love we should have for ourselves that it would be wrong. I can also infer that as God created us in His image and God is life and God gave us an innate desire to live. This is not an evolutionary process. Every human being wants to live. And even at the last moment, often somebody who's wanting to commit or tries to commit suicide, there's this struggle inside of, no, I don't want to die. There's that fight for life because God's put it in our heart to live, to want to live. So when we come to a conclusion, if anybody ever does it, I think there's, a, there's, there's not a right thinking. Would you agree with that? The person is not in his or her right mind at that point. How God deals with someone who does something when they're not in their right mind, I feel a little more comfortable with that perspective that God's, God's more gracious than I am and God understands more than I. But whether the understanding is there or not, is there forgiveness available for one who commits suicide or not? There is a major church in the world that says it is a mortal sin and there is no forgiveness available. I just talked with somebody recently who said, well, it's murder. It's just self-murder. That's why it's an interesting perspective, and I can see why that reasoning would lead to there. But it, I'm not comfortable with the conclusion that that would lead because it would be an unrepentable sin. I'm not sure how God will deal with that. Would you agree with me on this, that God will do what is best, and he'll do it on the basis of Jesus' death and resurrection? I feel comfortable leaving it there. But let me address some issues up front that were actually addressed at that funeral. I was impressed with a new friend named Charlie, who now lives in Logan, who was the last one to speak to the family and friends, and he said there's going to be a time when you're really going to be angry. You might even hate Joe for what he did. You might hate God for letting things get to where they were. You might hate, no, look, God is big enough, he can handle that. And it's a natural, normal conclusion for you to draw. I mean, you're angry. So you're angry, and then on the other hand, you're going to feel sorry, and you're going to say, oh, why couldn't I? And you're going to turn it on yourself. It's funny how we take somebody else's grief and criticism and, and their own suicide, and we make it all about us, but that's the devil's playground again, right? What could I have done? What should I have done? How could I have been there? And now, now it's about me. It's not about me. It's about the person who has done what he did or she did, in this case, what he did. There is never a point when you're alive 
that there is no hope. Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, where there's life, there's hope. Now, in Jesus, there is always hope. And in the promise of God, he will work everything out together for good, even our blunders. There is such a river of love that God has placed us in that even if you capsize in it, you're still in the love of God. And neither life nor death will ever separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. There is a solid nature to the person of Christ and the hope that he gives. Don't lose hope. I can sense that while I'm speaking on this subject, I'm not speaking to anyone here who has not personally wrestled with this yourself. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but from the responses I'm getting from you non-verbally, some of you have contemplated suicide yourself. Some of you may be contemplating it now. I want you to think ahead to when you're gone, should you do that, and what you're leaving for people to have to deal with. His children, his wife, his family, his friends, had he been able to see just a few days ahead them sitting in that funeral home, hearing and saying what they were hearing and saying about him and his life and how valuable he was to them, how much they loved him, how much he helped them. If he could have gone just a little bit ahead and gotten out of himself at that moment and heard what they were going to say about him. And then I thought, why does this have to happen here after? What would have happened if, just speculating, everyone got together and had a party for Joe and said, we love you so much. You've really changed my life because, or you helped me here, you served me here, you expressed your love here, you picked me up this way, and I learned these things from you. If he'd have heard those things, what difference would that have made in his life? And so I started playing again in the devil's playground in what could have happened if. Okay, it didn't happen. But then I thought, how could I encourage my church family to be thinking about these issues? Listen, the people around you, you have no clue what they're going through and how they feel. You do not know, the the very people that you're sitting on the same pew with, you don't know what they're wrestling with and the grief that they're already facing and the sense of hopelessness and self-criticism. Somebody says suicide is the ultimate form of self-criticism. How about if we were to reach to each other and say those positive things to each other now while we're breathing eyeball to eyeball, how much I love you, how much I appreciate you, how much I enjoy your presence, how much I've learned from you. What if we were to do that with each other now and each moment we cherished? Because it's not just the suicide that brings us face to face with the fact we're going to go through grieving. We've got some folks who are getting older. Have you noticed that? Look around. You know, we all are. And whether it's through old age or accident or illness is going to take us, we're all exiting this world through a six-foot hole. And the fact of the matter is, one day this person's going to die. My body's going to go back and go back to the ground from which it was made. And I, the real me who lives inside this body, will go on to be with the Lord. Yes, it is true. I am not my body. I live in this body. You are not your body. You live in the body. What is it about the body, the human body, that we so want to hold on to and make it look as if it were alive and, and even glorify the body to a point of you know, putting on the makeup or, or making it look so that this, wow, it just looks like he could just sit up and talk to us, doesn't it? Death is ugly. And we, we make it look pretty almost to the point where it's appealing. God's put within us, each of us, a desire to live. 
Death is not appealing. On the other hand, you're in Christ. And you're facing death. Now let's all come to the realism of the fact that you're going to die. You've gone to the doctor and the doctor said, you're terminal. You're going to die. And then the doctor says, I don't know when, but you're terminal. You're going to die. It may be 30 years. It may be 50 years. It could be tomorrow. You're going to die. And death is no respecter of persons. You could be six years old. You could be 20 years old. You could be 90 years old. You're going to die. So what do you do to prepare for the death? First of all, don't short-circuit God's timetable. Okay? Let him decide when it is you're going to go. Don't you go deciding for him that you're going to go early. Number one. We'll deal with some other issues about that. Number two, not only contemplate your own death, but recognize this. God has given you the opportunity to make funeral arrangements ahead of time. Where you die together with Christ, turning your back on sin, you be buried together with Him in baptism, and as you're raised again, let Him give you new life. So that then the final hole through which you're going to pass into the next stage of our journey, that final hole is not so terrifying. You've already died. You've already been buried. That's the first death. You've already experienced a resurrection. And you're truly alive now. And Jesus said you're going to pass through death into life. You believe in me, even though you die, yet you shall live. Jesus said that. Hold on to that promise. So you can experience your own. Go ahead and make your funeral arrangements ahead of time. Don't commit suicide. Commit self aside. Die to yourself and let him become your life. And let him forgive your sins. Takes the weight off of the self-criticism. Okay, I did those things. You're right. And Satan can blame you and accuse you. But you can now turn to him with the blood of Jesus and say, all of that's true, but I'm forgiven. And I am loved by God. Claim that. I am loved by God. You're loved by God. Far more than you will ever love anyone. In preparing for your own exit, does it make sense that we would have an open, frank discussion about that with those who are going to be left behind? Would it make sense that we would even, at a younger age, talk about these things with our children, our grandchildren, with our husband, with our wife, with our parents? Seriously, kids, you can be talking about this. You know, if I were to die before you die, here's what I would like done at my funeral. First of all, I don't want to be a sad occasion. I want it to be a time of celebration. I love the fact that when Paul Eckstein, my spiritual dad, died... He had, all, he had written out specifically what he wanted done at his celebration. And he said, first of all, it's not a funeral, it's a victory service. Second of all, I don't want my body laid out where people are going to come up and look at the body. That's not me. I want a picture of me, a large picture in front where people are going to see me when I'm alive. And I want them to think of me this way, not that way. Well, there's not a sense of closure. That's not the kind of closure we need. Paul said, I want to train you so that you will grieve not like the world does. You're going to grieve, but don't grieve like the rest of the world. So prepare and let people know this is a celebration time. This is a victory. He overcame death. I'm going to overcome death because I'm in him. Those who die in the Lord are blessed. Those who die in the Lord, your relationship today is in the Lord. For you to die, that's a happy experience, a blessed experience, not a sad occasion. And so it is, at your funeral celebration, prepare people. And let your family know, don't just lift up the body. In fact, if you have an open casket prepared and say, I want people to be able to come by and visit and see the dead body... I'm not there. Recognize that's my body. You can come and look at the body if you want to. But when the casket is closed, it's closed and it stays closed. 
You don't have the funeral, the celebration, the victory, and then open the casket and everybody walk by again. All the good that's been done is now, I think, undone. So best to leave plans ahead and let them know, let the ones who are still alive know, this is how I would like things to happen when I'm gone. I want people to say good things about me. That's called a eulogy. You say good words. You means good. Logy means word. A eulogy is good words. Okay, so I want some good words said about me when I'm gone. But really, that's not about me. What I want is for Jesus to be lifted up and exonerated. And if he has been in my life, don't you think he should be at my death? And so I think you should let your family know. You can say some good things about me, but be sure to focus on Jesus because he is the hope. And if there are people there that don't know him, this may be the time that they'll actually listen, that their hearts are open. Like I said, each of us are going to go through that final exit hole. We're going to to die, whether it's burial or burning or, or what. We're going to die unless the Lord comes and we're still alive. We'll be changed then. So how are you preparing for your own death? Have you thought about that recently? Been an open discussion? Funny how when you hear the words, you have multiple tumors or you have cancer, suddenly death becomes more of a reality and you start talking about and thinking about that a little more. I say funny, not funny ha-ha, but funny strange. Because that's more real for me now than it has been, and just maybe a little raw. And I don't know how else to deal with this with you except to do it this way. How about we learn from Jesus at the cross on how to deal with death and dying? How did Jesus die? First of all, he died with dignity, though he was in a very humiliating situation. Stripped naked, beaten, carried his own cross, nailed to the cross, publicly exposed, dying a very slow agonizing death he addressed certain issues number one he addressed the issue with God father forgive them they don't know what they're doing I would suggest to you I learned something from Jesus at the cross before you die there are probably some forgiveness issues you might want to deal with there's some people that you need to forgive or maybe even ask forgiveness for from them. There may be some folks you need to clear some things up with. Father, forgive them. Now, Jesus didn't need to ask anyone, would you please forgive me? Because he never did anything wrong. But he did have forgiveness issues. He dealt with a forgiveness issue at his death. And I think that, that instructs me. What's most important in life? People. Relationships. Father, forgive them. He expressed something about his physical needs. I thirst. Nothing wrong with saying, you know, taking care of yourself physically and and attending to physical needs. We need to tend to physical needs. And so as you're approaching death, don't ignore your physical needs as well. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What do we learn from that? What do we learn from Jesus at the cross in dealing with death and dying? How did he feel? Did he not feel abandoned? Did he not feel dark? Did he not feel alone? Yes, yes, yes. He felt it all. And he openly addressed that with God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I learned from Jesus at the cross. God is the one calling me home. God is the one who's in control of both life and death. God is the one to whom I turn at this point. And instead of this, I come in like this. When Jesus was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't an anger expression as much as it was an expression of aloneness. 
and this feeling of despair that he had taken our sins into his own body. He suffered in a way that's unique. No one ever did before. No one ever has since. The seriousness and the agony of the cross is not that he died on the most brutal way of dying. There probably are worse ways to die than the cross, honestly. However, (sighs) do you hear the horn? Somebody's car is going off. It's not mine because my keys are here. Everybody take out your key and hit the panic button. (laughs) Or am I just hearing things? (laughs) I'm hearing this trumpet call. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm being called home. (laughs) Is he calling me? (laughs) All right, somebody attended to that. Good. (laughs) What was I saying? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't the cross. It it wasn't only the cross. Don't don't get me wrong. It was was an agonizing death. But the true agony of the cross was my sin and his body. And he died as if he were the one who did it. He suffered the guilt and the shame in my place. I cannot comprehend what that is for billions of of people taking billions of sin into himself. So that's a unique aspect. But what I want you to see is Jesus was open and honest with God, and there wasn't any playing games with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Be straight up with God and talk to him openly. He already knows how you're feeling, and he can handle whatever it is you want to say, however you want to say it. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So here's what I want to kind of give you as a three-point ending. One, here are the appropriate stages of dealing with death and dying. There is a grieving time. It is appropriate to cry. It's not that we don't grieve. It's that we don't grieve like the rest of the world who have no hope. God is where we have our hope. Jesus is our hope. So we have a different way of grieving, but it's not that we don't grieve. There is a crying because we're going to miss the person. There are words of hope that are expressed, and that's what the celebration time, the victory service is. It is the celebration of a life, and it is the hope that is expressed. And the third stage is the moving on. That's represented probably in the, the meal time together, where there's a lot of laughter and stories told. Great time of fellowship and encouragement. Grieving, hope, moving on. Does that mean you never grieve anymore? No, doesn't mean that at all. Of course you're going to grieve. The person's gone. It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been together. In fact, the longer you're with someone, the more grieving there may be. A sense of aloneness when you've shared so much. But laughter is also important. I want there to be laughter at my celebration. It's only appropriate that jokes would be told. Good jokes, humorous things. Um, I was taken to this, and I want to leave you with it. It's kind of an interesting story. We learn in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes that everything has a time and season. The world and all the things in it are temporary, and that includes life itself. God promises us great things once we leave this world. In fact, Paul, side note, Paul said, it is far better for me to die to go on and be with the Lord. That's better. But then he followed that with, however, it's better for you if I stay. Oh, who's going to help me with this dilemma? I, I'd like to go on and be with the Lord. There's nothing here to hold on to us, except maybe I can still do some good for some other people. That's why I'll stay. And whether, whether I live or I die, Christ 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. All right, so back to her story. This, this woman is saying, heaven waits and, and in it all sufferings and pain will be gone forever. But we're human. We're still on this earth and there's still going to be hard times and there's nothing quite like losing someone that you love. There's comfort in knowing that we'll see them again in heaven. But, bless you, but a peace in our hearts will be missing up until that day. So we're going to see our loved ones. When I die, I'm not looking as forward to seeing the loved ones who have gone on as I am to see Jesus face to face. Supersedes all joy. I know I'm going to see my grandparents. I know if my parents precede me, they're going to be waiting for me on the other side. I'm aware of that. And there'll be some people there that I will enjoy seeing, but nothing like when I get to see Jesus face to face. She says, but Ecclesiastes teaches us that God has a hand in everything and he finds ways to use the pain. Consumed by my loss, I I didn't notice the hardness of the pew where I sat, she said. I was at the funeral of my dearest friend, my mother. She finally had lost her long battle with cancer and the hurt was so intense, I found it was hard to breathe at times. Always supportive, Mother clapped loudest at my school plays and held box of tissue while listening to my first heartbreak and comforted me at my father's death and encouraged me in college and prayed for me my entire life. When my mother's illness was diagnosed, my sister had a new baby. My brother had recently married. His childhood sweetheart so fell on me at 27 years old to care for her. I had no entanglements to take care of, and I felt it was an honor. What now? I asked, sitting in church. My life stretched out before me as as an open abyss. My brother sat stoically with his face toward the cross while clutching his wife's hand. My sister slumped against her husband's shoulder, his arms around her as as if he cradled his child. All so deeply grieving, no one noticed I sat alone. My place had been with our mother, preparing her meals, helping her walk, taking her to the doctor, seeing to her medication. Now she's gone. My work was finished, and I was alone. I heard the door open and slammed shut in the back of the church. Quick steps hurried along the carpeted floor. An exasperated young man looked around briefly and sat down right next to me. He folded his hands and placed them on his lap. His eyes were brimming with tears, and he began to sniffle. I'm late, he explained, though no explanation was necessary. After several eulogies, he leaned over to me and commented, Why do they keep calling Mary by the name Margaret? (laughs) Because that was her name, Margaret, never Mary. No one ever called her Mary, I whispered. I wondered why this person couldn't have sat on the other side of the church. He interrupted my grieving with my tears and fidgeting. He was, who is this stranger anyway? No, that isn't correct, he insisted. As several people glanced at us whispering, her name is Mary, Mary Peters. That isn't who this is? Isn't this the Lutheran church? No, the Lutheran church... (laughs) No, the Lutheran church is across the street. (laughs) I believe you're at the wrong funeral, sir. (laughs) The the solemnness of the occasion mixed with the realization of the man's mistake bubbled up inside me and I couldn't, I came out with laughter. I cut my hands over my face hoping that it would, uh, hoping it would be interrupted or interpreted as sobs. But the creaking of the pew gave it away. (laughs) Sharp looks came from other mourners, only made the uh, situation seem more hilarious. <laughs> I, I peeked at the bewildered, misguided man seated beside me. He was laughing too as he glanced around, deciding it was too late for an uneventful exit. I imagined my mother laughing. At the final amen, we darted out the door into the parking lot, and I do believe... I do believe we will be the talk of the town, he smiled. He said his name was Rick, and 
since he had missed his aunt's funeral, he asked me out for a cup of coffee. And that afternoon began a lifelong journey for me with this man who attended the wrong funeral but was at the right place. A year after our meeting, we were married at a country church where he was the assistant pastor. This time, we arrived at the same church right on time. My time of sorrow, he gave me laughter. In place of loneliness, I now have love. The past June, this past June, we celebrated our 22nd anniversary. Whenever anyone asks us how we met, Rick just tells them, her mother and my Aunt Mary introduced us. (laughs) (laughs) And it's truly a match made in heaven. (laughs) Talk about divine appointment. (laughs) It really is amazing to see God at work. Sometimes when things get hard, we forgot that He's always there, always at work. So the next time you find yourself struggling, know that he is with you. Hang in there because he'll use your struggles to his glory. I don't care what you're going through. There is a reason and purpose in all. Don't hear me say by that God has brought all the suffering in your life. But the reason in through the suffering is he will use that to his glory. And he'll bring moments of laughter. Grieve. Express hope. Move on. The person who dies in no way wants us to wallow in sadness over their departure. I do not want my family living for years and years, always grieving my departure. I want them remembering fun and fine times. I want them to remember times of joy and laughter and times of difficulties and suffering. I want them to look at that and realize that I want them, as after I'm gone, I want them to live their life to the fullest. And they're not going to be able to do that if they're always looking back at the gravesite. Jesus' resurrection gives us hope. He is our hope. And our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And so how do you want to respond this morning? I want you to respond to Jesus Christ. Will you do that? Will you make him Lord of your life? Will you surrender to him? Will you give him your life and then devote all of who you are and all that you ever will experience the rest of your life into his hands and say, Lord, I am at your disposal. Call me home when you're ready for me to be home, but fill me with life and hope and help me to love and give other people hope while I'm alive. Would you do that? Will you make yourself that kind of a commitment? And as a committee of one, say this. I will make a difference in someone's life to bring glory to God before I die. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will fill us with your hope and your peace and your joy that we may live our life to your glory. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing.